Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's good to be here. Yeah, Yindra changed the title of his talk, didn't change the title of mine. So mine's Geometric Forcing Part 2. I don't actually have a means to do anything. So, okay. Um, not yet. Okay, so the talk, I mean, Yindra sort of mentioned Part B in his talk, and that's what I'm doing. We're going to look at uh, forcing extensions of the Solovey model. I guess the Solovey model comes in various flavors. It doesn't actually really matter which flavor of the Solovey model we deal with, but this is the one that we're going to look, that, that I'm going to have in mind, but you can just do whatever you want. But just to go over it, so we have a strong and accessible cardinal, and we Levy collapse it to be alpha 1. Everything below becomes countable, and then we form the model. In that forcing extension V of G, we form the HOD, where we're allowed to have parameters from V, and also the new We're going to look at forcing extensions of this model. We're going to call that model W from now on and not worry about it. Um, and we're going to study uh, forcing extensions of this model, which recover forms the action of choice. Now, Yindra and I have a paper from the JSL in 2017 in which we separate various forms of the action of choice. In that paper, we work in the context of a proper class of wooden cardinals. Um, some of this material is that paper just adapted to the Solovey model. It turned out to be very fruitful to reduce the large cardinal hypothesis, which is somewhat surprising. I suppose you could do some of the stuff from no large cardinals at all, but we haven't really tried to do that. Um, okay, so which forcing extensions? Um, we're going to look at forcing extensions by partial orders that look like this. I suppose they're really pre-orders. They're orders that are reflexive and transitive and live on polar spaces. The members of the polar spaces are really codes for things, and so different things can code the same thing. So we can have things that are less than or equal to each other. And even when you mod out by that, the orders may or may not be separative, although they will be in all the examples that I do uh, today. All right, so the order is an analytic subset of this polar space, I mean the, the domain, and the order is also analytic, and the incompatibility relation is analytic. In this talk, all the orders that we consider will be sigma closed, but there are interesting examples where um, the order is not sigma closed, but still doesn't add reals. But those, that's the case that we're primarily interested in. Okay, so I wrote down some examples. These are just some of the examples. I didn't say this, did I? We have a book, right? We have a book draft which is on Yindra's webpage, and probably should be on mine, and uh, it's not. It will be eventually. Anyways, these are just some of the examples that, that we consider. Many, many, many examples forever. But, okay, so here are some of the ones that are in the book and some of the ones that we'll talk about in this talk. So the most basic one, Countable partial orders from the reals to two, that's just adding a wild set of reals. You've said, you know, at any given time you've said yes to countably many things and no to countably many things. You know, so you'll kill the proper, you know, perfect set property and things like that. Um, second one is countable subsets of P omega mod fin, I mean P, P omega, that have the finite intersection property under the relation of generating a larger filter. That is essentially P omega mod fin. It's forcing equivalent to it. It's not the standard presentation, right? But as we'll see, this presentation is more useful for the type of arguments that I'm going to do in these particular slides, but it doesn't really matter which presentation you use. Um, so that's going to add an ultra filter, a Ramsey ultra filter on omega. Countable partial selectors for any analytic equivalence relation that obviously adds a total selector under containment. Countable subsets of the reals, which are linearly independent over Q, that adds a Hommel basis. Um, countable almost disjoint families, or uh, almost disjoint families of various kinds, those will add mad families. Um, okay, I'm not going to read the whole list, but I'll read the top one on the next one. Countable subsets of the, of the complex plane, which are algebraically independent over Q, that's a very interesting example also, adds a transcendence basis. Okay, but the, the examples go on forever. Okay, so. All right, now again, okay, so Yindra's talk, right, he talked about equivalence relations and virtual classes for equivalence relations. You had an analytic equivalence relation and you had a name for a class which didn't yet exist, didn't yet have a member, but uh, the class represented by that name didn't depend on the forcing, didn't depend on the, the generic filter. So now we have this Suslin order, we have a equivalence relation on the polar space, which is things being less than or equal to each other. 
right? And so we have, instead of virtual equivalence classes, we have virtual conditions, okay? All right, so, so this is just an example of what Yinder was doing before, but in this context for, this, for these pre-orders. So a virtual condition, okay, so it gets a little confusing because there's lots of partial orders flying around. There's one partial order that we're forcing with, the Slusslin pre-order P. Okay, virtual conditions are names in, in, in some other partial orders, any other partial orders. So there's lots of other cues floating around. The specific cue really is not relevant, but there has to be a cue. So, all right, so a virtual condition in P is a pair Q tau, where Q is any partial order, and tau is a Q name for an element, of course, of P reinterpreted, and P is analytic, so it has a reinterpretation in the, in the Q extension. And the idea is you're a virtual condition if tau realizes to an equivalent in the less than or equal to each other sense condition in any forcing extension, regardless of how you, what the generic was. Okay, and that's what it, each other. If I take any two extensions, any two realizations of tau in generic extensions, any model that sees both of them will see that those two extensions were, those two realizations were less than or equal to each other in the, in the analytic relation. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you're right that I was, you know, a little bit concise. Okay. Very good. And there's a natural equivalence uh, notion of equivalence for virtual conditions. Like I said, if I take a regular extension of Q and keep tau the same, it's really the same virtual condition. All right. Or I could even assume that all the Qs were really lady collapses or something like this. I don't want to do that, but it wouldn't hurt to do that. You know, I get the same class of objects that way, up to this notion of equivalence. Streamlining the definitions from the book, and everything I say should be true both for these definitions and the real definitions, but I, uh, in, the, in the interest of not spending 40 minutes defining things. Um, okay, so we're going to look at a special class of virtual conditions, which we call the balanced conditions, and these, this is really the fundamental concept of the whole project. So again, we have our Suslin pre-order P, and we have a balanced, we have a condition, a virtual condition Q tau, and here's what it means to be balanced. It means that if I take any two, and it's a, I mean, there's a, there's a picture on the next slide, so we'll see the picture in a second, but I take any two mutually generic extensions, which are VH0 and H1, and in those two extensions, they have two Q generic filters, G0 and G1. And in those two extensions, I take two lower bounds, P0 for the realization of tau according to G0, and P1 according to the realization of tau according to G1. And remember, those are equivalent conditions. The two realizations of tau are really the same thing in the order. The two models have these two lower bounds, and now the punchline to being balanced is that in any model, in the any model that sees those two things, so in particular, they, since they're mutually generic, the extension H0, H1, those two conditions have to have a lower bound. They have to be compatible. So any two lower bounds in mutually generic extensions have to actually be compatible. All right, and that's what it means to be balanced. And here's my, my picture of this. I think you're gonna like it. Oh, man. Did it look like that there? Nope. Uh, okay, well, it's it's, Okay, fine. I mean, this, this, this is how the picture showed up on this screen for some reason. But all right, that's V, the big circle in the middle. Um, I have my two generic extensions like that, the V, H0, and the H1. By the way, it, it, it is a little confusing that we have Gs and Hs. The point is that the P0 and the P1 don't have to be added by Q. They're just added by further forcing that are mutually generic. So the H0 and the H1 are sort of bigger generic extensions than the Okay, so I've got my tau, my two realizations of tau, which again are really the same condition, right? I've got my two lower bounds for them in these mutually generic extensions, and now the model that sees everything sees that they have a lower bound, right? And that's what it means to be balanced. And so here's the prototypical. We're going to look at the p omega mod fin forcing, and here you can see why I forced with uh, sets generating filters and not the, the standard you know, infinite subsets of omega. Okay, so for partial orders, uh, the partial order of cannily generated filters, i.e. p omega mod fin, the balanced pairs are up to equivalence, just the pairs q, q tau, where q is just collapsing the reals to be countable, and tau is taking a ground model ultra filter, 
and enumerating it. Okay, so those are up to the notion of equivalence, all the balanced pairs. First of all, why does it have to be an ultra filter? Well, it has to, for each set, it has to choose between it and its complement because if it didn't, P0 and P1 could choose and then they wouldn't be compatible, right? All right, so my name has to be making up its mind about all the ground model sets. Otherwise, I'd have a potential incompatibility there. All right, and, this, and the, then why do all ultra filters work? Well, it's just a standard fact that if I have two mutually generic filters extending an ultra filter, they have to have the finite intersection property, right? I mean, so this, is, this really is just the, the basic argument, right? So I have my, my V and it has an ultra filter in it and I've got two possible, so we can draw this picture all the time, right? <laughs> uh, it, uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, yes, yes, thank you, you win, you, you get the prize, yeah, right. I'm not being sponsored by Disney, yeah, okay. But, but you might be sued by Disney. I could be sued by Disney, yeah, that's right, that's right, now that, now that I'm being taped. Great, okay, so, all right. <laughs> all right, so, so we have these two filters that are extending this ultra filter, right? I have a name for a set that's gonna be in one of those filters. I have a condition in my forcing, I look at, you know, not R, but the set of integers N such that R has not yet decided that N is not in my set, which is supposed to be in my filter F, which is containing my ground model ultra filter like that. The set of things I haven't said no to yet always has to be in the ultra filter, otherwise I couldn't be in a filter extending the ultra filter. But I have the same situation on both sides. So I have ultra, ultra filter many possibilities on each side, so I can always say yes to a common point. I can always put this point in, in both sets. Right, and so generically, everything, any two things in the filter on the two sides are going to have infinite intersections, okay? So in particular, I can't have incompatible conditions in those two models if they're, I mean, below this guy. Okay, so that's the prototypical example, but there are lots of examples. Um, here are some examples that are gonna make you think everything is easy, which it's not, but here are some easy examples. Uh, they're even easier than the one I just did. Right, if I have the, the countable partial selectors from a pinned, pinned equivalence relation, that just means that, you know, what does it mean? If I have two classes in mutually generic extensions, um, if I have the same class in mutually generic extensions that had to exist in the ground model already. If I have, uh, in the partial order of countable selectors on equivalence relation, the balanced pairs are just enumerate the total selectors. For the partial order where I just added a wild set of reals by countable choices, right? The balanced names are just the total functions. I mean, the collapse names for the total functions, right? In the partial order of uh, linearly independent sets, the balanced pairs are the collapse names for the Hummel bases in the ground model. That's, I mean, it's all, in fact, these are all easier to do because they all just use the fact that, I, th I think all three of them, well, pinned is a little different. Number two and number three just use the fact that they, they, there'll be no new reals in common in those two models, but otherwise it's the same argument. Okay, but just to convince you that not everything is easy, in fact, a lot of the fun in the book comes from finding the balanced conditions for your favorite partial order. So the wild, things get wild when you start to do things to equivalence classes. I mean, so I picked the simplest wild thing here. You have, you have an arbitrary Borel equivalence relation. You wanna add a tournament on it. A tournament is just a choice function on pairs, right? So you wanna just choose between each pair of classes, right? The balanced conditions are classified, in fact, by the total tournaments in the ground model, um, but the number of those, I mean, I'm sorry, the, not, the total tournaments on the virtual classes, so not on the ground model classes, on the virtual classes, and there can be up to, I mean, anything less than Beth Omega 1, many of those, so the, 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 the partial order Q isn't always just collapsing the reals, it can be, you know, collapsing something much bigger than the reals anything up to Beth Omega 1 in this case. Um, if you look at the partial order of filters disjoint from a given F sigma ideal, well, the class of balanced conditions is complicated. It's not just every ultra filter disjoint from the ideal. By the way, I mean, I could go back and just observe, if I can go back. This forcing adds a Ramsey ultra filter, but the balanced conditions are not the Ramsey ultra filters, they're all ultra filters, okay? This forcing, if I force to add, 
there are balanced conditions, but not every ultra filter works. If I try to run this argument again, I need to make the intersection positive for the ideal, right? And that's just not going to work in the same way. You know, I can't just follow my nose and make that happen. Um, all right, so the most interesting open case is if we just look at the partial order of countable sets of complex numbers which are algebraically independent over the rationals, are there balanced conditions? We don't know. There might, there might not. There might be, there might not be. Okay. So, all right, so like I said, we're going to force with these things and we're going to call a partial order balanced if below each condition there is a balanced virtual condition in the suitable sense of below. It'll be below after we actually do the partial order. Q. Balance is, in fact, not in general absolute. Of course, it's absolute for all the cases I just did because I just showed that they're balanced, right? But there are partial orders for which, you know, where you're doing things to equivalence classes where balance can be created or destroyed by forcing. The existence of balance conditions can be created or destroyed. So in light of that, and just because it plugs into the proof I'm about to do, I'll give you this definition. We say that P is cofinally balanced below kappa. If you can always force to recover balance, so even if you weren't balanced, you can become balanced again. Okay, that's what it means to be cofinally balanced. Okay, and cofinally balanced? Well, first of all, balance, balance just meant that there were, were balanced conditions below everything, right? But you can force to destroy or preserve, I mean, you can kill that or you can recover it, right? So cofinally balanced below kappa means among the partial orders in V kappa, if I force to destroy balance, I can always force with another partial order in V kappa and recover balance. It doesn't necessarily have to be a collapse. That's, that's curious, yeah, right. Well, that's what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah, right. That's right. That's right. But, but the recovering forcings can, we're not assuming anything about what they're like. Okay. So here's the prototypical theorem now in this area. I'm calling it Henley Matthias Wooden for cofinally balanced partial orders. Henley Matthias and Wooden studied what? The P omega mod fin extension of L of R, assuming some strong properties of L of R, complete Ramsey property, and so on and proved, among other things, that you don't add well-ordered sequences from the ground model. I mean, we're going to have that also, but I'm just going to give a simplified version of that just because it's easier to prove. Um, okay, so this applies to any cofinally balanced partial order. We saw that P omega mod fin is one, right? But if you have any cofinally balanced partial order and you force over the Solovey model with it, you don't add omega-1 sequences of reals, okay? and and. The stronger things are true, but this, this is sort of the basic argument type, and it's, all right, I'm not sure if it's if bad to do or not, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to at least sketch it, right? Okay? All right, so W again is our Solovey model, right? So I'm gonna try to draw a picture for this too. <clears throat> right, so, all right, so here's V, right? And now I've added um, my my V of G, I've done my Levy collapse up to something. And in W, I think that I'm going to add an omega-1 sequence of reals when I force with P. So I have sigma as a name for such a thing. Sigma is definable from something from V and, some, and a new real. And there's a condition P forcing it. All of that stuff was added at some stage. So I have my condition and I have my real down here. They were added by some small forcing. Some forcing after that recovered balance because I'm cofinally balanced, so now I have a VK here, like that, right, which thinks that my partial order is balanced. Now in the end, VK is only going to have countably many reals, and so my enumeration is eventually going to enumerate something not in VK. So something that exists in a forcing extension of VK is going to think, here's a condition, it added a real that wasn't in VK, here's the first place that that happened, here's that specific real. Right? And that all happened generically over VK, so now I'm going to go back to VK and take two different forcings, which made that thing happen. Right? But those two conditions now that, that decided that, they have to be compatible by balance, which means they have to think that the new real occurred at the same place, and they have to think it's the same new real, but there are no new reals in common in those two models, so it's all impossible. It couldn't have happened. All right, so that's 
That's the idea. I mean, it's probably too much to do and to read as fast as you possibly can. Um, okay, so, all right, so that's the basic argument. And the basic argument can be pushed. So here's a bunch of things, right? If, if you're cofinally balanced below a strong and accessible cardinal, and we have a Solovey model, and we, and we do the generic over that model, then in fact we don't add well-ordered sequences from the ground model. That's basically the same argument we just did. You preserve the pinned-unpinned divide for equivalence relations. I'm not going to talk about that proof. You don't have unbounded, linearly ordered subsets of omega to omega under mod finite domination. You don't have mad families, right? These are all versions of that. I mean, that, they're not, but they're, they're pushing that argument. Okay. Okay. So these are all things that, that can't happen in balanced extensions. All right. Now, balance is preserved under countable products or countable support products, although it's a little trickier to think about what you mean by that in the case of Suslin partial orders, but let's just say countable products for the moment. I have a bunch of forcings which are balanced. I can just take their product. That's a balanced partial order. So all these partial orders which I showed you were balanced. They have balanced conditions. I can take their product. I can do all those things at the same time. And that's a balanced partial order, right? So I can add an ultra filter, and I can add a wild set, and I can add a Hommel basis, and I can add selectors for all my favorite equivalence relations all at the same time. Right? That's a balanced partial order, right? So I do all those things at the same time, and when I do those things, right, none of these things happen. I don't add well ordered sequencers in the ground model, and I don't add mad families, and I don't add dominating linearly ordered families in omega to the omega, and I preserve the pin divide and so on, right? So you can do all the good things at the same time, and none of these things ha will happen when you do that. Okay? All right. Very good. Now, the notion of balance can be tweaked. It can be strengthened and weakened and so on, and you can separate classes of partial orders in that way. So the first variation is, is weak balance. Instead of, work, instead of accepting any two mutually generic extensions, we say, okay, look, you tell me the two partial orders you want. You tell me two names for the conditions which are going to be lower bounds. I get to pick the generic extensions. I'll find the lower bound, right? So here's the Disney picture for that, right? You told me what the partial orders were. I went and picked the H0 and the H1 and, and the realizations of the two names, and now I can find a lower bound for those two in some forcing extension, not necessarily mutually generic extension, okay? And this henley Mathias argument that we just did actually works just as well for this case. I really didn't need to live with any two generic extensions. I could have just picked my own generic extensions, All right? And that would have worked for them. Okay, so that's a weakening of balance. Remember, balanced forcings couldn't add mad families, but in fact, you can come up with a weakly balanced forcing that does add a mad family. So you can add a mad family without adding an omega-1 sequence of reals. Or anything. Um, okay. So that's a weakening, or we can strengthen it. Instead of dealing with things, instead of requiring the two forcings to be mutually generic, we can just say, let's just insist that they don't add any new sets in common, right? Right, so now we just say, well, any two extensions that don't have a, you know, have a new set in common, we can, and any two, well, here's the picture again. There's supposed to be something, there is something there, you just can't see it, <laughs> believe me. Um, Right. For any two extensions, as long as they don't have new sets in common, any model that sees those two extensions can find a lower bound. So this is stronger than balance. And some, some forcings work in this context, right? So you can, you can think about adding a selector to a countable Borel equivalence relation. Well, if I have two partial selectors in models, you know, in extensions, you know, well, they already they already done selections for all the classes in the ground model, right? And now they've done selections for the new classes, but you know, the assumption is there are no new classes in common. So of course I can just take the union of those two selectors, right? Um, or adding a Hommel basis or the cyclic subgraphs I'm not actually talking about, but those are in the book also. Okay, so some partial orders can do, uh, have the stronger form of balance. And if you have the stronger form of balance, which is called trim balance, then you don't add ultra filters. In fact, you don't add a transcendence basis over the um, 
over the rationals, right? So we're already seeing, interestingly enough, that the difference between a Hummel basis, you can add a Hummel basis and you won't add a transcendence basis here, right? Interesting thing about this is, is it's the dot product. The dot product is just strong enough to do things that linear operations can't do, to separate a transcendence basis from a Hummel basis. Okay. Okay. Actually. Yeah, one other thing that was interesting about it. In this mad family model, I guess, we showed that you preserved all hypergraphs. You know, many, part of this project when we were thinking about it several years ago was trying to express as many forms of the axiom of choice as possible as just chromatic numbers for Borel hypergraphs. Like a selector is just, just, you know, connect everybody who's in the same class. And if you, you know, if you give a count of the many colors, then you can pick one, right? Because you can well order the colors and, and so on. But as it turns out, well, okay, some forms of the axiom of choice are chromatic numbers for hypergraphs and some aren't. Um, like mad family. Design. Where am I? Okay, so this one is a bit of a mouthful. I will, I will say it. This is yet another variation of balance. It's MN balance. <clears throat> All right. So M and N are integers. M is greater than or equal to N. And MN balance says, OK, so I have M many generic extensions. They have the property that each subfamily of size N is mutually generic. And I have a lower bound condition in each of them. And then the punchline is, in that situation, I can find a common lower bound. All the examples we're going to look at are 3-2 balanced, so here's the picture there, right? I've got three different extensions. Each pair of extensions is mutually generic, but possibly not the whole thing. So I can find a lower bound for the whole thing. Some partial orders are 3-2 balanced. Naturally, in the same argument I just did for selectors sort of shows that selectors ought to be 3-2 balanced. They're really n-2 balanced for any n. If I have a bunch of partial selectors and each pair is compatible, then the whole thing will be compatible, right? Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, here's one, nope, not yet, okay. This is something else, so, so fine. So some of these partial orders are three, two balanced, selectors, injecting the E classes into the F classes for partial orders, linearly ordering your favorite partial classes from your favorite Borel equivalent relation. Again, there are things you can't do with three, two balanced things. You can't add an ultra filter. Now you can't even add a Hummel, uh, oh, yeah, right. You can't add a Hummel basis, and you can't even add a discontinuous homomorphism. Um, and I wanted to draw that picture, too. So actually, the, the last result is stronger than, than the second. I mean, we have three different forms of the axiom of choice. One says you have a Hummel basis, right? And one says, what, you have an E0 selector or a Vitali set, right, or an E0 selector. And one says you have a discontinuous homomorphism of the reals, whatever, or your favorite Polish group, or whatever. But let's just do the reals. Okay, so it's a class. These are classical theorems that are maybe a hundred years old or something. I don't really know, unfortunately, who to whom they are, <laughs> uh, to whom to credit. Maybe Sierpinski or something showed that these two things. Okay, all right. So, so the third theorem there is a strengthening of the second one. And I thought I'd sketch it quickly because it, it's kind of cute and shows you sort of how 3-2 balance arises naturally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oops. There we go. All right, so here's just an example. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of sketching that proof quickly. Um, so let's suppose we have a, a polar space. For any polar space X, we can just let PX be the partial order of containment for non-empty open sets. It's like co-enforcing for X. We're going to add a Cohen generic element of X. Let's suppose we have a Polish group on, oh, it's G. So G dot is the operation, G is the set. Look at the set of X, Y, Z such that X dot Y is Z. PC then is itself a Polish space, and I can force with PC. When I force with PC, each pair is mutually generic for PX open sets. I can shrink my x, y open sets to meet some dense condition, and that determines what z had to do, and then I can shrink for y and z, and I know what x had to do, and so on. Right, so when I force with pc, I get three real each thing isn't, isn't mutually generic for px, because it's in this one thing that I added. 
All right, so let's try this picture again, right? I've got V, I added my three reals, my X, well, I'll call them X star and Y star and Z star. I added them with PZ, but they're pairwise mutually generic. Now let's suppose I had a name for a discontinuous homomorphism. It's discontinuous, which means that when I generically added a point, I didn't generically determine its value according to the homomorphism. But I can continue to force, to, to choose the value on the homomorphism. So there's sigma of x star that I decided now. And here's sigma of y star that I decided now. But over here, since it wasn't decided already, I'm going to force two different ways and force two different values for sigma of z star. And I can do this in a way that I'm still pairwise mutually generic. So these three guys have a lower bound, and also these three guys have a lower bound. And that's impossible, right? Right. OK? OK. So all right. So we're not getting a discontinuous homomorphism in this case. But OK. But this forcing, remember, whoops, right? It could have been adding an E0 selector, right? That's, that's a 3-2 balanced partial order. So in particular, right, I, this doesn't imply like that right, in this case, OK? All right. <clears throat> now, there are other variations of balance. I, I mean, I don't want to keep marching down this path, but they're fine. There's, there's a, a version of balance. I mean, if you happen to, this is only useful if you happen to go look at the book, I guess. But there's a version of balance that's called adequacy, which is good for looking at uniformization principles like um, Asger talked about in his talk. There's another ver a variation of balance called charm, which is good for preserving chromatic numbers. Or, but it's okay. I'm not going to go into those right now. There are other tweaks with balance. Um, I'm going to do. What is, okay, this is it's sort of a callback to an older technique for analyzing these models, and and I've kind of shoehorned it into this talk in kind of an awkward way, actually. But all right, we can we can talk about preserving balance under a forcing. You have a balance condition and you want to force and still have it be a balanced condition. And, and again, the prototypical example is the ultra filter. I think I have it on the next slide. Right, if I have an ultra filter, I mean, many theorems about LR of U were proved by saying, well, here's a forcing which preserves Ramsey ultra filters. If I have some pathological set, it has to make a decision about the generic real, but it has to do that at the stage of some condition. And so it has to make the same decision about all the generic reals below that condition. And so maybe that's too many reals for whatever pathological set you're, you're thinking about. Right? So that's a classical argument for analyzing LR of U. I've sort of done it here for the argument that shows that when you add a generic ultra filter, you don't add an E0 selector. That theorem was first proved by right, De Prisco and De Dortwich. They didn't actually prove it this way, although they used that argument type to prove many other things about this model. The theorem that you don't get an E0 selector in the P omega mod fin extension has, I don't know, at least five different proofs now. Schlaw and Zafdal did prove it essentially using this, this technique. Well, all right, so I basically said what's here. But I mean, here's an example, right? You look at the sigma ideal generated by the partially zero selectors. You look at the forcing Borel modulo that ideal. That forcing happens Ramsey ultra filters, right? So, if P finally has R preserved balance conditions, which P omega mod fin does, then then in the extension there's no E zero selector. Essentially, for the reason that I said, some condition would have to make a decision about the generic real. In particular, it would have to make the decision about what's the symmetric difference between the generic real and the selector for its class. Right? But there are many generic reals below that condition, and they all can't satisfy the same fact. Uh, and in particular, there are generic reals in the same class that are distinct. So they can't have the same symmetric difference with the same real in their class. OK. Um, all right. And there's another version of this where you, you preserve your random, I mean, you can preserve under random forcing or co-enforcing. So if you can show that your balance conditions are preserved by random forcing, then your forcing is not going to add non-Lebesgue measurable sets of reals. 
if your forcing is preserved, if your balance conditions are preserved by co-enforcing, then your forcing is not going to add sets without the property of bear. And you can do this for the for the infinite, not not for a generic MAD family with countable approximations. Did I say this? I probably skipped over the word. We called our special MAD families improved MAD families, right? So for our special MAD families, you have this. So conditions are preserved by random forcing, and so you don't add non lebesgue measurable set of reals. Now that theorem was first proved by Horowitz and Shalah. In fact, I mean, we only proved it because we heard they had done it, and then we went and tried to do it with our machinery after they did it. So, so I saved until this point to say that based on looking at their paper and one other brief conversation I had with Sahran, it's he probably has some machinery that runs parallel to what we're doing. I, I'm going to see him next month and talk to him. I, I don't really know what the, what the relationship is, so that'll be an interesting thing to explore and figure out. But I mean, I think he has a body of work that's, that has some uh, positive relationship to what we're doing here. But, okay, I will find out eventually. Okay, so that's yes, yet another thing you can do with, with balance. Okay, very good. Now, some ZFC results popped out of these things. I mean, not ZF, ZF results. We're trying to separate forms of the axiom of choice. We're trying to press, push various arguments. Sometimes you can't do it. Sometimes like, oh, no, actually, I can actually prove that thing. You know, actually, this thing implies that thing. Um, so here are some examples like this. Um, Linearly ordering classes. It turns out if you add an ultra filter, you linearly order the E0 classes. Right? You, you linearly order them because it's hyperfinite. Right? If you have a if you have an equivalence relation with finite classes, you can linearly order the classes by just taking the least member of each. Right? Just because you, know, you can pick from the classes. <laughs> right? And now if you have an ultra filter, it's not exactly the ultra product of the linear orders, but you can use the ultra filter to sew together those linear orderings into a linear ordering of the E0 classes. And now going from finite to E0 to E1, and so you can do it again. You can e linearly order the E1 classes using an ultra filter. Um, the second one came, I mean, I, I did this argument probably way too fast here for doing no E0 selector in the ultra filter model. Trying to push that argument led to the observation that, in fact, a discontinuous homomorphism between separable bonic spaces does imply the existence of an E0 selector. So actually, you do have this one going this way, like that. Right? So that means you don't have this one like this. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wait. I don't know, I'm just momentarily confused. I thought I, I thought I had a way to, to answer this one also, but I'm trying, either I said it, or I'm going to say it, or I just totally forgot to do it. <laughs> you can all help me with basic logic. Can, can I answer this one from what's written on the board? I don't think so. I, I, I thought we had an answer to that one too, but maybe I'm wrong. It could be in the open questions. Um, I don't know. What's that? Maybe we don't know. I, for some reason, I thought we knew, but but maybe not. Okay. Um, all right, the last uh, one I have on here is existence of a Hommel basis implies the existence of a, of a set intersecting each E1 class in a non-empty countable set, and in particular you can inject E1 into F2. Okay, so this is interesting in, in one case since one thing doesn't obviously have anything to do with the other, but, but the proof is sort of amazing also. And so here's a sketch of the, of the proof of this fact. All right. So we assume we have a Hommel basis B. We can code the Hommel basis with a, with a set B prime in such a way that any model that's amenable to B prime can pick up enough of B so that M intersect B is a Hommel basis in M. Right. So you, you can code, I mean, the Hommel basis itself isn't a sufficient code, but there's, there's a way to code the Hommel basis where 
if, if you see the relevant part of the code for your own reels, then you can figure out that HOML basis for your own reels. Okay? Now, if I'm given X, e, E1 lives on the omega sequences of reels, so I have an omega 1 sequence of reels X. And now I just look at the models L for this B prime and a tail of X. So I'm forgetting bits of X as I go. This is a sequence of models where I, I look at the tails of my sequence, right? So I'm forgetting about the earlier, earlier reels in my sequence, so the models shrink. The models stabilize, the reels in the models stabilize. It doesn't make any sense at all. The reels don't have anything to do with one another. Okay, but I can't forget, you know, just, you know, I, I keep trying to forget and eventually I can't forget anymore, right? And you stabilize, and when you stabilize, that's a countable set of reels, and you can intersect it. And, and not only that, it's a countable set of reels which, which has a member of the E1 class of X in it, because you stabilized at a point that had a member of that E1 class in it, right? And so you can intersect with that E1 class, right? That's totally bizarre. But the magic of Hummel bases, I guess. Okay. All right, all right. So I'm almost done. I mean, a couple more things. All right. So here's some ZFC theorems that popped out of this. And, and again, okay, so now I'm skipping over a whole bunch of machinery from the book. So now, so now I'm just giving you some consequences of classification that I haven't talked about at all. Um, the P omega mod fin forcing adds a Ramsey ultrafilter, and Ramsey ultrafilters don't have to exist, right? They're the non-existence. You might think that it's true for every partial order in L of R that you could, you could force that there's no, yeah, I won't take that long, yeah, there's no generic extension, right? But that's not true. For some partial orders, at large cardinals just imply there's an L of R generic filter, right? Not P omega mod fin, but some other ones, right? So the, count, the, the partial order of countable injections from the reels to the reels, or the partial order of uh, partial, partial selectors for your favorite Countable real equivalence relation, or the partial order of you know, that adds a Hommel basis, right? That's what this says. Um, th that's, those are three examples of partial orders for which there exists an L of R generic object. Large cardinals implies that. I mean, it's it's not trivial at all, right? I mean, you, CH could fail, and you're building the thing, and you might just get stuck. You might have a partial object of size L of one and a dense set from L of R, L of R you're supposed to meet, and maybe you just can't do it, but. In these cases, you can do it, right? And so here's a cute consequence of that. I mean, it doesn't actually, the, the consequences are, I mean, have all been proved by other means earlier in the talk, but it's still kind of cute, right? Each of the two following statements is forcible, right? It's forcible that for every non-principal ultrafilter, there's a P point in LR of U because you can find it to one, reduce it to a P point, and therefore construct it in LR of U. It's also forcible that there are no P points, right? If you have a partial order for which generics have to exist, for which they always exist for in L of R below every condition, well, the theory of that extension can't be changed by forcing because the theory of L of R can't be changed by forcing. So the theory of that extension can't include there's an ultrafilter, right? Because you'd be able to change then whether or not there's a P point in that extension, right? And the theory is invariant, can't do it. Right? So a forcing for which generic filters have to exist can't add a p-point because the theory of p-points is amenable to forcing. All right? Okay? I mean, in fact, we, we I mean, okay. The, the specific examples of this were already proved just using balance, but it's a cute consequence of, of this analysis. Uh, yeah, that's what, certainly what I want to say. Yeah, that's not what I said, but cannot add, yes, thank you. Right, right, okay. So, I mean, I close, I guess I'll close, we'll see. Um, I, I put two questions in here. I mean, there are many questions about LR of U. They may not all be interesting questions, but I mean, there are many, many, many questions one can ask about LR of U. I just picked the, the most egregious one. It's not known when you pass from LR to LR of U if you collapse any cardinals at all. Right, so we don't know if there's any sets in LR, in, in the Soloway model, whatever, where you can't inject one to the other in, in W, but you can inject them in LR of U. 
On the other hand, the cardinals for which we know you preserve non embeddability is, is a tiny, tiny class. So, and there's already you know, an endless variety of open questions just right there. The other big open question from the theory is whether, um, I mean, whether you can make this theory work for, for adding a transcendence basis. If you look at countable algebraically independent sets, what happens? For all we know, it just adds a well ordering of the reals. Right? So it's holding mysterious forcing from the point of view of this technology. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you.